Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez. Officials in Los Angeles are offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the capture of the so-called Night Stalker. He's the sadistic killer wanted for a series of murders and rapes. Ramirez entered the courtroom wearing sunglasses and shackles. He's accused of 43 crimes, including 13 murders and multiple counts of rape, robbery, sodomy, and oral copulation. The so-called Night Stalker is blamed for seven murders in the Los Angeles area. The proceedings against the devil-worshipping drifter began four years ago. Early on, he had displayed a satanic symbol and proclaimed, Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Crime spree covers 50 miles. A suspect varies the time, place, and type of attack, but he always enters through an open door or window. Whether satanic serial killer Richard Ramirez acquired any sense of remorse during his quarter century on San Quentin's death row, now we probably never will know. Dead at 53 of liver failure, Ramirez is remembered for his own description of himself at sentencing as a servant of Lucifer. Hey, I'm Serenity and this is my channel and welcome back to another episode of Hometown Horrors. Today is day two. Hometown Horrors is a new series I am starting on my channel. I grew up on true crime and I've always been fascinated by why people do what they do. The whole nature versus nurture aspect. Hometown Horrors is going to be a series on my channel where true crime cases that have some sort of significance based in my hometown county and surrounding area. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, sister city to Juarez, Mexico. There is an insane phenomenon. Sinidad Juarez, Mexico is one of the most dangerous cities in the world, often ranked in the top 10 on the yearly analysis list. And until two years ago, El Paso, Texas had always been ranked as one of the safest cities in America, often in the top 15. That was before an outsider with an extreme hate for Hispanics massacred 23 people. El Paso, Texas has not made it back onto the safest cities in America list yet. No matter how safe a city may be, there are always crimes being committed. As someone who grew up in the city knows the ins and outs and can tell you exactly where parts of crime have taken place and what parts of the town are dangerous, I have this knowledge, which I believe can help bring a certain perspective. As I said, El Paso is one of the safest cities for years. There are only so many criminal cases that I am able to cover until I run out. Thus, I will also be covering cases from surrounding areas, including Juarez, Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Horizon, Texas, Chaparral, New Mexico, and other surrounding areas I have been to and am very familiar with. That way, I'm still able to give that aid in knowledge. Before we begin, I just want to give a trigger warnings for rape, sexual assault, mutation, child murder, domestic violence, physical assault, murder, Satanism, and abuse. If any of these topics you believe you would be unable to handle, please stop watching. Put yourself first and I'll see you at a later date with a different video. If I get any information wrong, please kindly let me know below. I tried my best to get the following information as accurately as possible. However, I used about seven different sources and if only one mentioned a certain detail, but I was unable to verify it using another, I left that detail out or went with the most commonly reported aspect of that detail. Sources will be linked down below. I tried to use only respected websites. If I'm looking to the side of the camera which I know I am it's because I have my laptop where I have my script loaded if I didn't have a script then I would forget so many details and go off topic constantly I apologize if this is any inconvenience lastly this video is an informational research study that I'm sharing for academic entertainment reasons only I mean no harm to anyone mentioned now grab your blanket and let's begin again I'm wearing the same El Paso strong shirt from yesterday I only have three shirts that are El Paso based and I only paid ten dollars for like all three of them Ricardo Leve Minos Ramirez was born on February 29th 1960 in El Paso, Texas, making him a Pisces. He was born on a leap year and the actual leap year day, February 29th. Technically speaking, he only had a real birthday every four years. Many of five being born on the leap day leads to a lucky life, but we'll see about that. He went by the name Richard or Ricky, something that is very common in this area. We have people go by their English name. I once had a friend who was a Korean immigrant in school and since his birth name was hard to pronounce to non-Korean speakers, he went by the English translation, Sam. I've also known someone whose birth name was Juan, but went by Johnny. It may seem like a small insignificant change, but it's very common down here in the 915. As you may have noticed, Richard has two last names, another thing that is common in Mexican culture. Often times, children are given both their mother and father's last name. Sometimes the names are hyphenated, and in others, the mother's maiden name just becomes the child's middle name. Ricardo Leve Menos Ramirez just went by the name as we know him today, Richard Ramirez. I was trying to find exactly which part of the city and hospital he was born at, but I am unable to find that information. It was just going to be an extra insight I thought I could give, 
life. However, I digress. Richard was born to Mexican immigrant parents, Mercedes and Julian Ramirez, who was the fifth and youngest child to his parents. His four older siblings' names were Robert, Ruth, Jose, and Ruben, all of which were born with birth defects caused by their mother working at a boot factory, where she was constantly being exposed to toxic chemical fumes while pregnant. I could not find what boot factory Mrs. Ramirez worked at or whether it was located here in El Paso, Texas, or across the border in Juarez, Mexico. I was also unable to identify what kind of birth defects the other four Ramirez siblings had or if Richard was born with any. At just the young age of two, a dresser fell on Ramirez's head, causing some sort of forehead laceration. Three years later, at age five, he was knocked unconscious by a swing and soon began having epileptic fits. Throughout his childhood, Ramirez experienced multiple head injuries. It is also believed that Richard was abused by his parents, his father mainly, and his dad, even once tied into a crucifix as some sort of punishment. However, there are limited articles on this information and not widely reported enough to claim it as fact. Just keep this in mind. At age 12, Richard became close with his cousin Miguel, or as he went by, Mike. Mike had recently returned back from fighting in the Vietnam War. The two would smoke weed together, and the older cousin would tell Richard about the rape, torture, and mutation he caused to several Vietnamese women. One story collaborated with a picture of Miguel posed next to the severed head of a woman. Miguel's stories were corroborated by several graphic photos as proof. It is also believed that when Mike showed Richard those pictures, Ramirez began feeling his first exposure to sexual arousal. Just a year later, when Richard was 13, he was a witness to his cousin faintly shooting his wife, Jesse, in the face using a revolver during a domestic argument. Think about that for a second. We all have older cousins, but at the very least, Miguel was five years older than Richard. Being at the youngest recording that was enlisted in the Vietnam War was 15. That's not including how old Miguel was when he got back and having to be at least 18 in the state of Texas in 1972 to legally get married. What is at a minimum 18 year old doing giving his 12 year old cousin weed and showing heinous pictures of brutal crime, becoming sexually aroused to it, not knowing why, then to top the whole thing off. Just a year later, Richard was the first hand witness to his cousin murdering his wife. Miguel was prosecuted for his wife murder and found not guilty due to the reason of insanity. And after four years in a Texas state mental hospital, Mike was released. The cousin Sue became close again. I am unsure if Richard ever had to testify as a witness to the crime, nor if Miguel was charged with the inhumane crimes he committed against those Vietnamese women. This just topped off the abuse and horrid acts Richard was exposed to at a young age. Around this time of 13 to 14, Ramita started breaking into homes. He was soon a fresh in high school and was a known marijuana dealer. He was also an admitted glue sniffer and weed smoker. To be truthful, that was pretty common during this time. My uncle had the same addiction. And worse, that man now worked in a high paying corporate job. I'm gonna be honest, during this time and into the early 2000s, it was not hard at all to cross the border into Sinaloa, Juarez, Mexico, buy some weed, cross back over the border, undetected, and sell it here in El Paso, Texas, especially at a high school during the 70s. I mean, if my mother could cross into Juarez Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Saturday to party only for a quarter each way during the mid to late 90s, then it was not too hard to smuggle weed back over the border. Anyhow, I came across an LA Times article in which it claims that, and I quote, Ramirez never seemed to have a job or a girlfriend. And that is simply not true. This is where my odd little connection comes into the story. First thing is, I don't know if Ramirez ever had a real job. I mean, he was a weed dealer, but how much of a job is that? If you count it, then cool. But the never had a girlfriend part, I know for a fact was false. My mother's high school friend's mother dated Richard Ramirez freshman year of high school. There's a picture of the two together, and if I can get my hands on it, I'll have it on the screen now. They broke up, obviously, but how scary. Back to the timeline. Around this time of freshman year, Ramirez was trying to find some sort of escape from his father's abusive temper. This is also around the time Richard would start shoplifting food, practice pickpocketing his own friends who claimed they wouldn't trust him, and he taught himself how to be an accomplished burglar. He was nicknamed Ricky Robin, meaning thief in Spanish, and dedos, meaning fingers in Spanish. Before migrating to the United States, Julian, Ricardo's father, was a policeman in Juarez, Mexico. Then, after migrating over the border to El Paso, Texas, he became a laborer on the Santa Fe Railroad, which still runs today just under a different name. And you see these trains all the time. There's a whole railroad system throughout the whole city. Julian was known to be prone to anger and having a temper. Richard claimed this made his father physically abusive to his entire family. This led to Ramita sleeping in the Concordia Cemetery at time and would later sacrifice animals there. Concordia Cemetery is also located next to one of the most well-known restaurants here in the 915 LNJ's Cafe, which has been open since 1927 
And funny enough, anytime a well-known celebrity passes through this, this city or shooting some sort of movie here, that is where they eat. And this place has won countless awards. So it's not a secluded place by any. The cemetery is in a residential neighborhood, viewable from the freeway, located slightly under an underpass. And this restaurant is constantly packed from open to close, seven days a week. However, it is a running joke that the Concordia Cemetery is haunted, but since it gets so much passerby traffic, the ghosts are scared to show themselves. Soon, Radimides dropped out of Jefferson High School, where there were 3,200 students. He got a little attention from the two assistant principals, Cesar G. Mendoza and G. Arin Tejejo. Richard was known as a quiet boy known for his proneness to ditch class. A former teacher, Dick Sculler, an electric shop teacher, said Ramirez was essentially a troublemaker. He didn't give a damn about anything. I do know that he hit the dope pretty hard and that he was very into rock and roll. Some sources claim that Ramirez dropped out at 17, making him a senior in high school. And others claim it was at 14 as a freshman. After searching mercuriously through Jefferson High School yearbooks from 1973 to 1978, I believe he dropped out as a freshman because that is the only picture proof I can find him in. Some sources claim he dropped out in his senior year, but because he skipped so much, he was never classified more than a freshman academic achievement wise. For three years, Ramirez traveled back and forth from Los Angeles to El Paso, living in both places vicariously. It is also speculated he would go to Juarez, Mexico to buy weed while in El Paso, Texas, then sell it in Los Angeles, California. He was arrested for the first time at 17 in 1977 for marijuana possession in California. He continued to commit crimes after this arrest. Then, in 1981, at 21, he was briefly in prison for a sting of burglaries, including car theft for five months. He then moved to California full-time, developed a cocaine addiction, continued to burglarize homes, and soon generated an interest in Satanism. Then, in 1984, at 24 years old, Ramirez was arrested again for auto theft and served 36 days in prison in Los Angeles County Jail for the second time. At this time, you could see a visible decline in his neglect of personal hygiene. Richard was a tall six foot one skinny man who was self-conscious about his weight, suffered from severe tooth decay as he started to create a gap and were discolored, making them his most distinguishable features. He lived in shabby hotels with other drifters, small time criminals, and infirmarials in both Los Angeles and San Francisco skid roofs, having only enough money to buy drugs, a place to stay for a short amount of time, and some food. Shortly after his second release from prison is when Richard's crimes escalated from skilled burglar to murder and rapist. In June 1984, Ramirez committed his first known dabbing, rape, and murder of a 79-year-old widow named Jenny Vinco, all during a burglary of her own home. At this time, this was believed to be Richard's first truly violent crime. However, in 2009, Richard was implicated in the April 1984 murder of a nine-year-old girl after his DNA was found at the crime scene. He was never charged with the crime, so keep that in mind. Richard Rodriguez then waited eight to nine months later to resume his killing. During this time, the murder case of Jenny Vizcao remained open and yet to be solved. We see this trend a lot with serial killers where they stop after their first kills to see if they will get caught, then continue with the brutality or when police are on their tails, they lay low to throw the police off their track. On March 17th, of 1985, Ramirez attacked a woman named Maria Hernandez, who managed to escape. He then killed her roommate, Diane Ozaki. Richard was not satisfied by these assaults, so on that same day, he shot and killed Sasai Liam Hu, which sent the media into a craze, and Ramirez was bestowed the Night Stalker, or Valley Intruder, by the press. The panic these crimes created made a rise in gun sales consequently. This is where we start to see the pattern of how Ramirez would commit his murders, rapes, and crimes as a whole. The crimes mostly took place in Los Angeles area, took place during home invasion, and the victims were beaten, sexually assaulted, and evidence of satanic symbols were found at many of the crimes. Only 10 days later, on March 27th, Ramirez murdered Maxine Zazara, age 44, and her husband Vincent Zazara, age 64, using a COVID attack style. The husband would be shot first by being br brutally assaulted, then stabbed to death. In this case, Maxine's eyes were also gouged out. It was believed that these eyes were mailed in a shoebox to Ramirez's El Paso, Texas family home. The El Paso Police Department filed a warrant to search the family's home, but nothing was ever found. A full-scale police operation was in force with no avail. Ramirez continued his attacks on the retired couple William and Lily Doy in May 1980. During the next few months, his murder spree escalated, claiming another 12 victims and a mania of assaults, burglaries, brutal violence, 
and satanic rituals. The Los Angeles Police Department put together a dedicated task force with the help from the FBI when assistance was needed. Restless media and constant police pressure along with descriptions from surviving victims compelled Richard to leave LA County and on August 17th, he took his next two victims, Peter and Barbara Pan in San Francisco. On the night of August 24th, 1985, Richard made some grave mistakes that would lead to his capture. After being spotted outside a Mission Vejo home, he left an unwittingly left footprint before a witness saw him in his car and memorized the license. Later, Ramirez raped another woman in her home after shooting her fiance. She was able to provide the police with a description of Ramirez and claims he forced her to swear her love for Satan. Richard's car was found a few days later, abandoned. Enough fingerprints to make him a match using his criminal record, the police were finally able to put a name to the Night Stalker. Print media and national TV coverage blasted his mugshot along with clues given by witnesses and survivors, all led to Ramirez's capture on August August 31st, 1985. He was found badly beaten by East LA residents while attempting two different carjackings. Richard waited in jail as his trial was constantly put on the back burner due to a series of motions and bickerings between the prosecutors and defense along with the crimes being spread between two counties complicated the trial proceedings. Between trying to figure out where to have the jury be sourced from, certain charges against Richard were dropped to expedite the long journey to justice. Jury selection began on July 22, 1988, and the trial commenced the following January of 1989. As we see in many cases of men serial killers, Richard attracted a cult-like following of supporters, many of who wore black clothing, Satan worshippers. Ramirez would often dress in black clothing with dark sunglasses during the trial, and the self-described Satanist made a very references to the devil during the trial and drew pentagrams on his palms. In an odd turn of events, one juror was found murdered on October 14, 1989, causing a delay in the trial. Rumors began that Ramirez organized her death, but there was no evidence to link these two. On the 20th of September, 1989, the jury unanimously found Ramirez guilty on the 43 charges against him, 13 for murder, 5 counts for attempted murder, 11 sexual assault charges, and 14 burglary charges. Just two weeks later, this same jury recommended the sentence of death on 19 counts. As he was leaving the courtroom, Richard Ramirez responded, and I quote, hey, big deal, death always comes with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. And big deal, death always went with the territory. The now convicted murderer was formally sentenced to death by gas chamber on November 7th, 1989, and was sent to San Quentin Prison in California to spend his days until exile. Seven years after his conviction in 1996, Ramirez married one of his supporters, Doreen Loy, a 41-year-old freelance writer, middle-aged woman. Sister Ruth, brother Joseph, and his niece Joseph's daughter attended the wedding at San Quentin, California prison. He appealed to sentence in 2006 after a long wait and made it to the California State Supreme court where it was rejected. While on death row, Richard Ramirez was diagnosed with cancer and after 24 years in prison on July 7, 2013, he died at age 53. From complications from B-cell lymphoma shortly after, he was taken to Marin General Hospital in Green Bay, California. His El Paso relatives soon released the following statement, and I quote, We are mourning the loss of our son and brother, Richard Ramirez. The world judged him, whether fairly or unfairly, it no longer matters. He is now before the true judge, the judge that sees and knows all things. We ask that you respect our sorrow and grief. His family still does live here, central El Paso, even after all these years, and eight years after Richard Ramirez's death. What do you think about this true crime case? I personally wonder if he had a grudge against Asian people. Maybe that has to go back to his cousin killing all those poor Vietnamese women and showing him those pictures. Many of his victims had Asian last names. I noticed while researching, there are many Asians here on the 915. I would say about 15% of the 1 million people who live here are Asian. More of the minority here is white people. I'm not saying white people are a minority because they are definitely not. But about 5-8% to 8 of people here are white and it's mostly the people of military who live on base in Fort Bliss. Do you feel like Richard alluded to the abusive upbringing brought on by his behavior? It doesn't make anything he did justifiable at all. Let me know your thoughts, opinions, and more down below. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and click that bell right next to the subscribe button to be notified when the next episode of Halloween Hometown Horror Week goes live. We still have another two, three, or four very interesting cases to get through. The doggo picture of the day is this picture of... Scarlett and Daisy mad at me after I finished writing this script at 4 a.m. on a Tuesday night. Remember, all my socials are linked down below, including my blog, craft page, dog Instagram, personal Instagram, Pinterest, and Snapchat. Go check it all out. Remember to take care of yourself. Love you. Mean it. Kisses. Don't do anything stupid. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.